Okay, Mark Ferrandino, uh, M-A-R-K-F-E-R-R-A-N-D-I-N-O, and I'm Deputy Superintendent of Operations for Denver Public Schools. So I'll let you guys ask the questions. Um, so of our roughly 200 schools and over 150 buildings, um, we have about 55 um, who don't have air conditioning uh, currently. So about a third of our schools uh, buildings or about a quarter of the actual schools because some of the schools on shared campuses and things have multiple. Can you talk about the potential delay school by a week or anything like that? Yeah, you know, we're hearing um, from a lot from both families, teachers, community, um, and we're wrestling with lots of different issues as we look at cases going up. Um, here in Colorado and here in Denver, we're not seeing the same spike. We're seeing an increase, but not the same spike. And trying to figure out how do we do, and how do we open up safely? Um, and so we are looking at lots of different options, including delaying uh, the start of school by one week, also by looking at a phased approach to um, re-entry into school, either through um, some type of, not everyone coming in every day at the beginning. Um, and that's a, a few factors of why. One, making sure teachers and uh, school leaders have time to plan, work on protocols, and make sure they're comfortable with what's happening before kids come in. Also, one of the reasons we're looking at a phased approach to reopening is so that kids have time in smaller groups to be able to learn the protocols, work through that, and see you know, how things are going to adjust with a smaller group of students than all kids coming back. Um, and then also we do have you know, about 50 plus schools without air conditioning. We know the end of August can be hot. Um, and we always are monitoring that. And if it's really hot, we'll call either early release for a heat day or we'll call the entire day off for heat. Um, and we know as kids are, and staff are gonna be required to wear masks and where we might not be able to, and we're still working with health officials on both swamp coolers, fans, we might not be able to use those, what we usually use to cool those buildings, that the heat um, is gonna be a bigger factor. So we're either gonna call and be more, um, more willing to call heat delays or heat uh, early closures. Um, and so delaying it allows for planning, it helps with the heat a little bit, and also a phased approach. Not having every kid in the building during those hottest days also will help with heat as well. Yeah, we are working with health officials um, to make sure we're following their guidelines. You know, we have our nursing staff who's working closely with them. And, you know, a lot of us are not necessarily the experts on health. That's why we're relying on their guidance. Based on their guidance, um, one of the things that we are doing is uh, requiring face masks as well as cohorting, putting kids into groups. Um, and so that if some one kid or a adult was to test positive with COVID in that cohort, we were able to quarantine that group of individuals for 14 days. Um, and we are still working on, depending on how large a case, uh, how large the number of students or staff who have cases, how, when we would close down a building. And we're meeting with health officials this week and continuing, and, and they have promised us over the next couple of days and weeks, we will get guidance on both what is the um, guidance for both the cohort, which we have, but also school-wide, school closures and district-wide closures. We're seeing states all across the country look at different uh, metrics. Uh, a lot of the metrics that they're looking at is the positivity rate of tests. Um, and you know, we in Denver are consistently on average below 5%, which is great. Some places are seeing test positive rates of over 20%. Um, and so we're monitoring that closely and working with both local leaders and local health officials to make those determinations. Give me a, yeah, I cannot hear, hold on. You know, w one week, as well as, as we're looking at the phased approach, I think will help mitigate, you know, most of our schools do have air conditioning. Um, and you know, we also are looking at, and we always do, do we release early? Because 
you know, the great thing about living in Colorado, except for these last couple of days, um, is it cools off pretty early at night and we have systems and we just, the, the Board of Education just uh, authorized the investment of $5 million into uh, putting new filters uh, um, and improving testing and making sure all of our HVACs, our heating, venting, and air conditioning in all our buildings are up to the highest standards that we can, um, in upgrading filters in them. And so we can do what we call night purging, basically get the cool air into the building at night, then be able to shut the building so the building stays cool in the morning. It heats up as the sun gets up and later, but in a lot of places our kids are out early enough that the building doesn't heat up, but that's why we monitor the temperature. Um, and we use fans and swamp coolers to address that on a typical year. Likely we're not able to do that now. That's why one week will help, but also with less kids in the building, if we phase in as kids come in, we know that bodies in a room raise the temperature of a room. If you have less bodies in the room, that will reduce the increase of that temperature from what we were able to cool it at night. And so we are looking at all those different approaches, but also for those 50 schools roughly that don't have air conditioning, we will be much more likely to call either early release for heat or move for to remote learning for those days that are hot, that are still, you know, we don't want to bring kids in because of both the, the inability to cool those, those spaces. Um, so we're hopeful to make a decision on both the um, delay to August 24th as well as uh, a phased approach into starting school um, by early next week. But I will say um, the only constant is change right now. and. We will continue to monitor what's going on and listen to local health officials. If something changes and we see a large spike in cases in Colorado, that will change what we will do. And we will make those decisions as quickly as possible to inform families so that they can plan. But if we hear from health officials that we need to switch, we are going to do that. Just like when we, on I think it was March 17th, we announced we were going to move to extended spring break we were talking to health officials. They said, we need to do this. This is what we recommend. And we were like, okay, yes, we would have loved to give more time to families, but we're gonna do what's, um, when, it, when it comes to the health and safety of our students and our staff, we're gonna make the decision based on what health experts tell us and get that information out as fast as possible and then implement that as fast as possible. We're still working on that. Um, we went out to the community to ask about a hybrid approach of an A-B schedule, which would be roughly 50-50. Now we do have the option of kids going fully online and we're getting that information back from families um, on that. Um, we've seen nationally anywhere from 15 to 30% of school age kids opting for a virtual um, school. So that would still, so if you're thinking of those kids who want to be in person, if you did 50-50, it's probably in the 40% of a typical capacity range, um, but it will depend. We're still looking at, do you do it by age, by grade levels, do you do it by an AB schedule? Those are still uh, in conversations. Um, that's, I have to legal would know that I don't, I couldn't talk about that. Um, so on PPE, we've been, our team has been working hard to uh, purchase. We have warehouse now of a significant number of masks for both staff and students um, that we can provide, uh, as well as face shields, and as well as plexiglass barriers for certain areas and also places where you might be a little closer that we could put some um, where it would make sense. Um, so lots of PPE, thermometers, and other things that we're looking at, that we have purchased and are actually in waiting, um, and we're um, putting those out to schools. That also includes hand sanitizer, disinfecting we bought, um, 
um, electrostatic, uh, they're called guns, but electrostatic um, disinfecting uh, machines that um, basically our custodians can wear and be able to clean and disinfect a room very quickly. And so that'll allow us to be able to disinfect more uh, often. And so those protocols we're hiring. So if someone, we, we, we are hiring part-time custodians, um, the job, dpsk12.org, our job board. Um, if you are looking for a job, we're hiring and we need people to come and help um, disinfect. Um, we are getting great applicants right now, which is great. Um, we're getting lots of applicants in for those roles, but always can use more. And on the testing, we are in similar conversations um, with Gary and Vet Gary Community and others on testing, similar to what Aurora uh, has provided. And we're hopeful we can make an announcement soon um, on the ability to provide testing on an ongoing basis for all school-based staff. Yeah, um, so cafeterias, food, um, the expectation is for the most part, kids would eat in their classroom. And so either that could be the kids would go down to the cafeteria, get in line, um, get their food, and then come back, and kids would go in cohorts to the cafeteria. It could also, depending on the school, be that we would put points of sales across the building to spread it out and do it quicker. All of those things will be at a school by school because schools are unique in what they can do, how they're laid out, how their, um, how their flow of the day is. And so um, kids will not be sitting in the cafeteria eating. They will be in their classroom uh, for the most part. There might be few exceptions um, based on different needs, but for the most part, they'll be in there. Recess, um, the guidance that we have provided is kids need to stay in their cohorts. Uh, in their groups, six feet apart outside. You can have multiple groups out as long as those groups are in separate areas. But we're also recommending to our schools, you know, fall is a great time and we have great weather in Colorado once we get past the heat. Um, that having classroom outdoors. I remember when I was a kid, I loved when we could do classrooms outdoors. And we are encouraging our, our schools to be outdoors because we know it is a safer place to be is outdoors. Um, and so we're working on facilitating that and encouraging that within our schools. But it has to make sense for safety, um, both physical safety and health safety as well. Yeah, so we will be uh, screening uh, both staff and students uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, either they'll be required to do it before they come in, um, or if they haven't done it, they'll it'll get done um, at the school. If someone is uh, has a symptom, they'd be asked to go home if they're with their parent, or we would put them in a room. Each school is designating rooms for people who have symptoms to then, when they can get picked up by a, uh, a responsible adult to take them home. And then we would work with them on what is the next steps, whether, um, is it, you know, do you need testing? Here's how you can get testing. Is it um, just some other illness and we just need you to wait, you know, a certain amount of time when a fever is done? And that is all dictated by health guidelines from health officials that we are working and continue to develop those guidelines. Yeah, you know, we're just getting the data about who is looking at the virtual school um, and we're just about to open up registration. But those are all factors that we are looking at. Just don't have an answer right now on those. No. Um, so teachers are coming back the exact same time that they are planning on. So there's no savings um, as, from like large savings from the district because we're paying teachers for those days. Um, bus drivers usually come in, start early, start running their routes. We'll continue to do that. It's more time for training um, for staff so they can um, feel comfortable with the protocols, learn, adjust. 
um, and make sure that we're ready to open and welcome kids back. It's not a budgetary decision. There's definitely big differences uh, in schools um, in terms of grade levels. So, for example, elementary students usually stay with one class most of the time uh, already. I, my daughter is going into third grade. She has her class. She might intermingle during lunch and during recess and maybe specials, um, but usually they're in one class. And that will continue, and instead of specials going to art, art teacher will come to them in their school to do art in their classroom. Um, so there's a little difference. In high school and you know some middle schools where kids have more optionality of what type of the classes they are, we're looking at, you know, usually they have seven to eight periods. It could be that they have three to four periods. Um, and there is some mixing of kids throughout the day, but that is still one, we're looking at a cohort of a group of kids. It might be more than 30 in, in what, a, you know, 25 to 30 in a typical class. Um, but that would be, you know, if there was a positive case, that entire cohort would have to quarantine. And so balancing the, the nuances of how do you make sure kids get the access to the education they need while also limiting um, the exposure risk of uh, the virus if, if someone was to test positive. But there are going to be uniquenesses, different levels, and that's why one of the things we're working on with school leaders is plans at each of those levels so that they can look at the uniqueness of whether high school or elementary school and how they implement it to make sure kids are getting the education in a safe and welcoming environment. Yeah, I mean, I think some of it is what's going on on the ground within the community. And so looking at that, I think our goal, and I think as Superintendent Cordova said, you know, we want to get as many kids back in a safe way as possible because we know kids in the classroom with their teachers, with caring, loving adults um, is the best way for them to learn and be supported. Um, and we are looking at how do we do that and get kids back in a safe way. And so some type of phased approach allows us to look at um, how do we make sure the protocols, both kids are learning that and adults are learning that and we're practicing that and adjusting that. So that's why we're looking at a phased approach. But we know if caseloads go up, we would likely have to move to a hybrid um, situation. There is, I mean, there is risk um no matter what in you know with covid in we're as we are doing anything there is risk uh, what our job is based on the best signs the best health officials to mitigate that risk to get kids into school in a safe environment but we are going to do it led by the health experts on what they're telling us and what they're guiding us maybe one more okay yeah if i got five minutes so maybe one or two <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, I'm a parent. My daughter is a DPS student going into third grade. Um, and I think we're all nervous. We're all nervous just in, in the world today. This is, you know, we, we haven't gone through this. Um, and hopefully we never go through this again. Um, and it, it's challenging from a, you know, emotional perspective for all of us. We all have our good days, our bad days as we're dealing with this. As, you know, with my daughter, you know, it, it can be really, she has her great days and she has her days, she just wants to go see her friends and it, it's frustrating for her. And, you know, for kids, I think one of the things that really gives me comfort is as we talk to the health experts, as they look at what's going on, kids do not seem, based on all the evidence, to be, as, uh, to be a vector of spread for the virus. Unlike influenza, unlike the flu, where kids usually spread it a lot, uh, COVID-19 is not something that seems that kids are spreading based on the evidence and the, and the guidance from health officials. And so with proper protocols, with, you know, hand hygiene, with face masking, with social distancing, with health screenings, with testing of adults, 
you know, we feel we can bring kids back into schools in a safe environment. I, I'll be sending my daughter back to school in DPS um, because I feel like we've put are putting the things in place to make sure that we are reducing the risk. And, you know, it is I go walk in those schools. I, I, I love walking into elementary schools and seeing the bright, shiny faces of kids um, as they come back to school every August to, to, you know, the excitement of a new school year. This year is going to be different. Um, we're going to see kids with masks. We're going to see kids have to be a little farther apart from each other. Um, but we know kids learn best when they're in schools. And we know they need that loving support. Uh, there are long-term social, emotional, developmental impacts of not having kids in school. And that's why the health officials are really clear that w we want to bring kids back to school, but we need to do it when it's safe. And luckily, you know, the leadership of Governor Polis on consistently wear a mask. Um, you know, I think that has helped us not see the spike that other places are seeing. And if we can continue to do that, we can all continue to do our part to keep the spread of the virus down, we can welcome our kids safely back into school.